we're very thrilled to have John Schmidt with us tonight. Do we have any John Schmidt fans in the audience? Okay. <laughs> We've known John for many years, and even though I'm uh, quite a bit older than John, he is a role model to me, and I really look up to him for the passion and the tenacity that he has used to create his dream in life, and so we're very fortunate to have him here. Uh, John started playing the piano at a very early age and showed exceptional talent. So he started playing in assemblies and classes, and he started accompanying choirs. He then went on to college. He got a degree in English, and he was contemplating getting an MBA. Uh, he really loved music, but he kept being told over and over again, you can't make a living playing the piano. And then he met Lionel Richie one time in Colorado, and Lionel really encouraged him and inspired him to stay with his music. So what John has done is he quickly diversified into a variety of sources of revenue to support himself full-time in music. So he created CDs, he created and sold sheet music, he got his music on Pandora, he did concerts and he taught lessons. And then, after a period of time, uh, he discovered the internet and YouTube. So he teamed up with Stephen Sharp Nelson and a couple of other guys and formed the Piano Guys. And very quickly they had millions of views of their videos and then they were signed by Sony Entertainment uh, as their agent, and they now travel all over the world, perform uh, in cities all over the country. When I met with John and asked if there was any chance we could get him here at Utah State, he had just come back from a European tour of 12 concerts in 14 days. So this guy's working. He's busy. You might ask, uh, you probably know his, his videos now have received almost a billion views, 800 million, something like that, John? And uh, they're the number one act of Sony enter Entertainment worldwide. So you might ask, you know, why are we having an incredible musician here speaking in the Entrepreneur Lecture Series? And the reason is very simple. John is an entrepreneur. Uh, at the Huntsman School of Business, we teach entrepreneurship as the new leadership model for the 21st century. So it doesn't matter what kind of business you're building. It can be for-profit, it can be non-profit, it can be a school, a foundation, a church, or a band. The skills of entrepreneurship apply in any career. And uh, John has actually used all of these skills in building his business, uh, whether he knows it or not, but he has a driving purpose in what he's doing. He has incredible passion and tenacity. He builds teams, he's used mentors, he's learned to effectively market his skills, and he dazzles his fans and stays close to them with uh, products and basically videos that they like and songs that they like. And so John is an entrepreneur and that's why he's here. Uh, if any of you have interest in entrepreneurship, we have a phenomenal program in the Hudson School. We have uh, an e-club that's very active on Tuesday nights where you can come and learn how to build businesses. We have a minor in entrepreneurship that you can attach to any major here at Utah State. Uh, so it doesn't matter really if you're a musician or an artist or a writer or an engineer, a scientist or a landscape architect, these skills apply to you and we, we would love nothing more than to help you develop the skills of entrepreneurship as part of your college education. So here's our agenda for tonight. John is going to speak and play, and I've told him he can, he can do that for as long as he wants. And uh, I told him, just quit when you're ready to quit. And then we're going to have questions and answers, and uh, we're going to have you tweet those questions in to us, and you know the, the address. It's um, at USU Clark Center. The hashtag is MJT3550, so the, number, the name of the class. So again, it's at USU Clark Center. Hashtag is uh, MGT3550. And then Carly from our center, one of our excellent staff members, is going to come up when John's finished, and she's going to field all those uh, tweets, and she's going to ask John the questions. Okay, So you can start doing that as soon as he starts playing, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Then afterwards, we're going to have our ice cream social out in the lobby, and uh, we're going to ask our interns from the Clark Center to leave during the question and answers to figure out how to serve 700 people ice cream quickly. So they will be prepared. We don't think you'll have to wait in line very long. So it's really my honor and a privilege to introduce Sony Entertainments, one of their number one artists in the world, my friend and the co-founder of the Piano Guys, John Schmidt. Thank you so much. 
I gotta say, Mike, I'm your biggest fan, and that is the truth. That is the truth. Mike and I go way back, and uh, he just he just felt sorry for me when I was a poor college kid, and kind of took me under the, under his wing and gave me advice. So, thanks, thanks for all the difference you've been in my life. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thanks for coming tonight, and uh, I thought maybe you would start out with uh, with a piano number. If that's all right. This is a little tune that I wrote, and uh, it's off of the Piano Guy's latest album, Wonders, and it's a little tune called Summer Jam, which is kind of an oxymoron at this moment, but I love playing this tune.
Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a little tune called All of Me uh, that I wrote. And um, yeah, I, uh, I've loved playing the piano for as, as long as I can remember. I started when I was about seven and uh, started composing. I wrote a really lame reflection song when I was about 11. That was, that was the first, first tune. Uh, but my first song that uh, I really was excited about was when I was about 13. And it was just something I loved. I would be playing the piano like some people play with the new Nintendo game. I don't know uh, any of you people that wanted a Nintendo game. It's, it's not Nintendo anymore, but uh, in my day it was. But like our kid would get the new game, and <laughs> the first day they would spend like four hours playing it. And then the next day it was like another four hours, another four and they were just obsessed. And that's kind of how I felt with the piano back in, back in the day before Nintendo. That was my, that was my Nintendo. And uh, so uh, just during, during, the, during the high school days, uh, it made up for a lot of ugly looks, you know, when I would play the piano for girls. And uh, I, that was quite a motivation right there. And uh, it just uh, turned into a career somehow. I'm not really sure how. But uh, uh, right about 21, um, I was asked to do a benefit concert for my high school. And I had uh, been sort of the school uh, entertainer at Highland High in Salt Lake. Do we have any Rams here? Yeah, yeah there we go. There we go. And uh, so uh, a few years later, um, somebody had the idea to, uh, to ask me to come do this benefit concert. And uh, 200 people showed up, and I remember thinking, you know, I should, I should like produce a recording. Uh, as as the time led up to it, I, I went into the studio and I, I recorded some of the songs that I had written, and um, put them onto a cassette. And I thought, you know, <laughs> I know you can laugh how old I am, but anyway, I thought I'd be so excited if. I sold five of these cassettes tonight, and uh, after the show, all 40 of them were gone. And I just, I thought they were just, I thought they were lying. I thought, you guys, are you kidding? And, and uh, I just the thought that 40 people were listening to my music in their car that day or wherever, I was just, I was so happy. I was so excited about that. And I was like, I hope everybody copies it, and then it'll be like, Maybe 80 people listening to my music. <laughs> and I was so excited. And uh, then the um, East High had um, an event, and they asked me to come and do a benefit concert over there. And uh, so this was about 25 years ago when this was going on, and it was so exciting. And uh, so at about a year later, I was able to rent a high school in Salt Lake and a thousand people paid money to come see me play the piano. And it was just, I was like, this is weird. This is weird, because it's a piano, and um, like I said, I'm not really good looking or anything like that. So, so I think what I tried to do is I tried to make up for um, my liabilities um, by doing crazy stuff and trying to and I think it's a good principle for, for entrepreneurship, this, this little idea of trying to just throw in crazy stuff or, or be um, outside of the ordinary. And uh, one of the things that I did was uh, played upside down with my hands crossed. And uh, maybe I'll do that real quick.
So what I thought I'd do tonight is um, I wrote down some things um, that I think apply to entrep entre entrepreneurial <sighs> ship. <laughs> entrepreneurial ship. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, uh, as I look back on, on my career, um, I thought I'll give an example of what, uh, how I think it, it helped or how it could apply uh, from my you know, early days before the piano guys, and then another example of how I think it's working as of five years ago when we formed the piano guys. And uh, hopefully what'll happen is it'll be something that people can adapt to whatever entrepreneurial situation that, they're, that they are in. And um, I think that, that one that we just started to talk about, um, in no particular order, I just kind of um, uh, uh, wrote these down. Um, doing stuff out of the ordinary. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, in addition to playing upside down, I, I don't believe I know of any other pianists that throw mini balls out into the audience at halftime. That was something that was fun to do. Uh, one time we did a water balloon launcher and did hostess ding-dongs until one of the hostess ding-dongs uh, exploded in the air because it was launched too hard and it just sprayed everybody. <laughs> so, so then we had to give that up. But uh, so I, and then we, I, I did backflips off the stage. I just I was desperate. Okay, I was desperate, trying to make up for my liabilities and and I and I think uh, uh, and I've seen other other people do this. I remember when Ben and Jerry's ice cream came out. They just were so anti-ordinary, you know? They were just like in opposition of ordinary. Like their flavors were the first flavors to come out and really grab your attention. I loved one of their flavors was called Cherry Garcia, which of course is the uh, lead singer of the Grateful Dead, right? Jerry Garcia. But their ice cream flavor, Cherry Garcia. And then they were the first ones that did cookie dough ice cream. I believe that Ben and Jerry's, they were just doing all this stuff that was kind of off the wall. And I think that's a really great thing to try to do as you market whatever you're marketing, is to do it in a way. And I think of the piano guys, um, we try to do the same thing and just do things that are out of the ordinary. I think the real key for anything that you want to do on YouTube is to try to do something or present something that people haven't seen before. And um, we, uh, we tried to do this with a, a tune, the very first tune that uh, the piano guys did five years ago as a group. Um, we had done other tunes before uh, with, with Paul, who is the piano store owner that uh, kind of got us all to um, try to join together our, 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 uh, our, uh, our efforts and our passions came together, uh, you know, mine as a pianist, Stephen Sharp Nelson as a cellist, uh, Steve and I both write music, we're composers and arrangers, Al Vanderbeek loves to work out of his studio, he also writes music and arranges, Paul Anderson owned a store full of piano and had cash, which is a nice talent to have, <laughs> and, and he also was a great videographer. He you know, was really interested in videography, and he had this crazy passion, just all this, always dreamed that how cool it would be to put pianos in the most bizarre locations and, you know, film a performance. That, that like, for years was his dream. So he'd like, he's like, guys, let's just have fun. Let's just put a video out together and, uh, he had seen a video that uh, Steve and I had done two years earlier uh, called Love Story Meets Viva La Vida. And, uh, it, and it was, uh, you know, he really loved that and wanted to just try it, try it again. So we thought, you know, let's, what can we do to be totally unique and to grab people's attention and not be ordinary? And I saw a gold mine in Stephen Sharp Nelson, who is the cellist for the piano. I'm about to play the video that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna, in fact, I should probably play it a little bit while I'm talking, but uh, the videos and
you go to date added, oldest to newest. <laughs> and you can see here, oh, I guess you can't see here. Oh, there we go, okay. Let's see, is there any way to focus it a little? Or if there's not, I'm fine. But, but you can see that w we did uh, Game Day, which is a little uh, original tune. Then we did the ever lovely Dumb Song. And then we did To the Summit. And then this is our first uh, video. These were all little favors to Paul, because I was good friends with him, and he owned a piano store. And uh, he's like, could we, come, we, could we just video some of your stuff so that I can market it on my YouTube channel? Because I'm hoping to sell more pianos with my YouTube channel than I do with these lame newspaper ads that I'm buying that don't feel like they're doing anything. So the first video we did with Paul, he put a piano in the middle of Snow Canyon and filmed that. And then <laughs> I don't know how he talked me into do, doing Dumb Song. Um, and then we did To the Summit. And then this is the one where we just said, okay, let's get, because I had done a solo career for about, oh, 25 years, and I had a mailing list of uh, about 20 to 30,000 people, which, which is really handy in an entrepreneurial venture, too. <laughs> distribution. Uh, distribution is king. Right, and and we kind of we kind of had a really great situation there, with 30 people that we could go to, to say, please share this in your address book on your email list because it was before the days of Facebook, ladies and gentlemen, if you can imagine that. So people were uh, invited to share these things with their address book on on Facebook, and they were such nice people, and. Uh, these, these people that had signed up for my email list. So they, they all shared it. But we found out that it was being shared then again, another generation, and again and again. And within a week, it was at a million hits. And it was just so exciting. Um, and what, what we thought, you know, because these first three videos here, we, we didn't send the mailing list. You know, you don't send your precious mailing list to see Dumb Song. You just don't do that. You know, these were favors for Paul. But this was our first attempt. We were like, let's do something different. And Stephen Sharp Nelson, ladies and gentlemen, is the uniqueness gold mine. He had just bought this new electric cello. And uh, so we thought, let's see how many sounds that an electric cello can make. Well, we tried everything. We tried, you know, bonking it on the ground. And it was the coolest bass drum sound. And we scratched it with a quarter. And it sounded like, uh, you know, that hip hop record scratch. And we tried, we tried everything. We tried slapping the stand the, on the back. We tried plucking it. This we've tried hooking up a, a U2 delay. We tried all kinds of different things. We found probably 50 different textures that we invented as we just tried every different way to get a sound out of that out of that electric cello. And then we thought, okay, we've got all these colors on our palette, all these textures on our palette. Let's create a song. And uh, so we created a song. This is an original tune called Michael Meets Mozart. And the, the, uh, the style of it is uh, sort of modern and classical. And that's sort of our favorite. That's, that's a lot of the style that, that uh, I had written things in. And Steve's arrangements that he'd done had that same. He loves classical. He loves modern. So we decided to take both of those elements and, uh, and put them together. And it originally was going to be a Michael Jackson cover. And then at the last minute, we uh, couldn't get permissions. So we just changed it quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you can still hear the Michael Jackson in there very slightly, but no jury in court would be able to. Here it is, Michael Meets Mozart, featuring Stephen Sharp Nelson. That's really how a bow sounds when you rub it, ladies and gentlemen. Put it on the loop pedal. Stephen 
Richard Nelson plays cello and kick drum simultaneously, which I think is so cool. Am I the only one that thinks that's cool? I, I just think it's so cool. There's the bonk of the, of the cello hitting the ground. just so you know. And then it goes to another one. We'll ask you if you recognize it. Nothing by Mozart, but I stopped making that face after that video. stuff Steve does and it was it was fun because it it uh, was it a million hits within I think a, a week and it started getting shared on uh, sites news sites uh, KSL picked us up uh, which was really really fun and it was just really exciting and uh, Happy that we're at 25 million hits today. And it's really exciting. And the thing that's fun is to read these comments. It's just so exciting, you know. There's somebody, uh, somebody, just instant, uh, instant feedback, and you can tell when people hate it, and you can tell when they like it. And I'm happy to report that. Uh, 210,000 thumbs did up and 1,000 thumbs did down. 1,500. Always makes your day. But it's just fun. It's fun to read through. Uh, anyway, I won't start reading comments. <laughs> Let me push a little pause button here. But um, I think um, I think one of the reasons why people liked it is because they'd never seen a cellist play with a kick drum before, and they'd never seen some of these textures. and And I, I would just highly recommend that uh, to do something out of the ordinary. I found it uh, very very helpful. Um, all right, number two. Uh, oh, can I just j just while we're while we're talking, I, I would like to play the song we did two years earlier, which uh, 
kind of opened up the YouTube portal for us. Um, and it was just, uh, it was, uh, I was, I was putting an album together, just to w the piano guys, this was p before the piano guys, I was trying to put together an album, and I thought, you know, I really would love to arrange a song, because writing and composing, I had done seven albums with compositions, and it's, it's, it was kind of, I was feeling a little bit of writer's block, and arranging is so much easier than, than coming up with c original compositions. So I thought, you know, I'm going to try to do an arrangement. And I, I asked my kids what, uh, what was a popular song at the time. And Taylor Swift had just come out with a, with a tune called Love Story. Uh, and the radio was still listened to in those days. <laughs> like every time it came on the radio, people would freak out in my car. And uh, their favorite part of this song was... Uh, this, uh, I'll just have it playing while I tell you this little story. Their favorite part of the song, oops, I have it all pulled up right here. Their favorite part of this song was the key change where, you know, well, you'll see. But again, we come in with a dog. do a goofy laugh. I think people love that sort of thing. And sometimes I get a little too crazy on it, on being, I don't know. I think in, in entrepreneur things, in marketing, I think sometimes it's good to have the perception that you are gutsy, that you're willing to take a chance and that you're not really too worried about people thinking that you're stupid. I, I think, I don't know, it, maybe you have to balance, maybe you have to be careful with that, maybe you have to temper that a little bit, but uh, I, I think I think it's it's good. But this this was the one that, that was the huge, huge revelation. We, uh, we covered Taylor Swift's love story and uh, threw it out to the mailing list, asked them to help out, and within a month's time, this one was at a million views. And we were getting emails and Facebook requests from Malaysia, of all places. Like, the number one market for us was United States. The number two market was Malaysia. Like, go figure, I just, I didn't get it. So, it was, uh, this was the one that Paul, the piano store owner, saw and that kind of lit his fire and his passion. He thought, boy, if we all got together, we could have a lot of fun. And I think that is probably the next thing I want to focus on is this whole idea that um, I don't think a lot of entrepreneurial things start as let's plan out exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> Just, in fact, Mike, I read your book, and what percent of the entrepreneurs that you interviewed, you interviewed like 100 entrepreneurs, how many of them said that it was just an accident? All 100. That's even higher than I thought. And that definitely was the case with us, where um, we, uh, we all four of us, Paul, Steve, Al, and I, all four of us, we're having fun. And it was just four people having fun converging in a very happy accident. And, you know, Steve and I, we had been playing. Um, he, uh, you know, he and I go back over 15 years just playing together, performing together on stage. You know, I would have Steve uh, come out in the early days for one song. And then over the, over the years, it just developed to more and more songs. And then pretty soon, I realized how funny he was. Uh, so we gave him a mic in the show, and everybody just thought he was hilarious. And he has a world-class sense of humor. And then all of a sudden, our show took on this Smothers Brothers vibe, where Steve just ripped on me all night. You know, <laughs> And it was just, just fun. And the audience loved it. 
and then it spilled over into the, uh, oh, here's my favorite part. This is the key change. Sorry. Try to keep the dancing at a minimum. But we decided to combine it with one of our favorites on the radio at the time, and that was a little song by Coldplay called Viva La Vida. And, you know, at first I thought, this is the dumbest idea. Like, I didn't dare really hear what people thought of it because I thought people are going to think that is the most random combination. And I'll bet a lot of people did. But we took a chance and we released it. And, uh, you know, like I say, in a month, suddenly people in Mal Malaysia knew me. I, I, like, I had broken out of the jello belt, ladies and gentlemen, which is that little strip from California through. <laughs> Arizona, Utah, Idaho, even in Canada. So it was a great, great experience. But uh, we're talking, oh yeah, passion. So my advice to you, if you want to, if you want to, you know, the best thing to do with your entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship is to make sure you start with a foundation of what am I good at? What, is my, what are my hobbies? What am I passionate about? What are my skills? You like cooking? You might just be the next huge cupcake chain. You just never know how things develop. When cupcake people meet business people, amazing things happen. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what's another thing here? All right. The next little item I wrote down was believe you belong, then act like you belong. And I, I think so many times, especially young people, they're afraid to believe that they actually belong in this world, that they have a place. The most... Uh, let me just so after it, I, I wanted to break down the fourth wall. Maybe I'll talk about it. Yeah, this arrangement is dedicated to my little daughter, Sarah. My seven-year-old, cute little Sarah. She loves this song by Taylor Swift. And uh, one, one time we were listening to it in the car, and she says, Dad, this is my favorite part. It's... It's, uh, you know, right, right where the key change happens, and, and uh, it looks like the boyfriend has, has gotten scared off by the, by the mean dad, and, and he's never coming back, and, and she's, she's about to lose hope, and all of a sudden, he, he comes back, and he says, hey, I talked to your dad, and he pops the question, and go pick out a white dress, and anyway... Sarah's part, and I, I tried to. Sarah's when I got to that part, part when I was arranging it, I, I tried to extend that that moment out a little bit. Anyway, at the end of that video, we we had a uh, a chance to do the unexpected again. Um, I thought, you know, a lot of people had uploaded uh, me performing All of Me, which is that second song that I performed. And then people were getting the sheet music to it and uploading themselves performing All of Me. And I thought, you know, I'd love to introduce people to something else that I've done at the end of this video. And I thought, I could do it in a lame way uh, kind of like a way that everybody expects, or I could do it a way that's unexpected. Um, I had a choice to put up a link to myself playing it, but I thought, how funny would it be if I put up a link to a kid that plays it better than I do? <laughs> and so that's the link that we put up. And uh, it was this kid right here who has a million views. His name is Mario Arias Gallego. And he has a million two hundred six views on 
it was just funny. Somebody says, too fast, you could do it a little better. <laughs> so it's just goofy stuff. People love that. And I think one of the things, one things that it does is it breaks down the fourth wall. And if you don't know what that means, it, I think it's a show business term where you have a stage and it has a wall here and it has a wall in the back, it has a wall on the side. And everybody acts like there's a wall here, too. But why? Why should there be a wall between you and me? I think that wall only exists when people take themselves really seriously, right? I think the minute you let yourself not take yourself serious, that wall comes down. And uh, there's lots of, lots of ways to do it. Um, I think I had a talent for this, a gift for this, back in the days of high school when I would tip over on my chair in class on purpose. And everybody thought it was on accident and would laugh at me. <laughs> and I would get the biggest kick out of that because the joke was on them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, think, I think there's an application there for marketing. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but <laughs> it might be. But just, just be willing to, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a, I'll just play uh, five seconds of this, don't, don't worry, but this might be a, an example of that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, for your entertainment tonight, John Schmidt. Yeah, that's the beginning of Dumb Song, so. <laughs> and I don't care. I don't care. I didn't even want them to put those, those words on there. I just wanted, th you know, Paul's like, we got to explain it. We got to explain it. Sometimes it's fun to act dumb. I never would have written that. So. So. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, if you're watching this, which I know you are right there in that camera. So, oh yeah, we're talking about, okay, what's the next principle? Let's see. Oh, sorry, I'm getting off stupid tangents. Oh, yeah. Believe you belong and then act like you belong. I remember my, my wife in the early days, um, she, would, she would say at my concerts, she would say, I can tell you're nervous. I can tell you don't believe that you belong on the stage. Somehow you need to get some confidence. And uh, she was right. And so I had to literally pretend like I thought I belonged. And pretty soon it became reality. And I think especially young people, like I, I know this high school kid named Wyatt Frazier, or when I, when at the time when I'm talking about, this kid didn't was too young. He didn't think he was too inexperienced. He didn't think he was too anything. He just thought he belonged. And that is so powerful. And as we were sitting with Sony Records, Sony Masterworks Records, which is their classical arm, and, they're, and they do uh, people like Pavara uh, yeah, Pavarotti and um, Yo Ma and Bobby McFerrin and as we were sitting in their office, um, I had a thought to myself, if we all act like I acted on stage where I just pretended like I thought I belonged, this, they're going to believe it. And guess what? This whole room full of Sony executives totally bought it. <laughs> they thought we belonged. <laughs> It was just amazing, and I, I want to read a little poem that I carry around in my wallet. I just, uh, this, is, this is something that was very useful to me because my parents uh, moved to the United States uh, from Germany. They're German immigrants, came right after the war. They're almost 90. They had... Uh, 
nothing, no knowledge of the language. Um, they had no experience. My dad uh, was a knife sharpener, had a, a, a portable truck sharpening service where you'd go to people's homes and uh, sharpen lawnmowers and, and knives. And so there was, there was no pressure on me as far as, you know, anything I could do, with, you know, anything I, I could do anything I wanted with my life, which was nice. But the disadvantage was um, I did wonder if I belonged in, in the world. And uh, I found a poem that I feel is absolutely true. It says, if you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you will lose, you've lost. Out in the world, you will find things begin with someone's will. It's all in the state of mind. That is absolutely true. I've been on both sides of that equation, where I didn't believe it and when I did believe it. And if an immigrant kid can pull it off, then anyone in this room can pull it off. If you think you are outclassed, you are. That is absolutely true. And in the business world, and in your entrepreneurial efforts, you cannot ever think that as you associate with people. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win the prize. Even if you have to fake being sure of yourself, it works. And pretty soon you're not acting anymore. There's a real truth to fake it till you make it. I used to be petrified on a stage. And I can testify that, that it works. Because it's no biggie anymore. It's a walk in the park to be on a stage. Life's battles don't go to the stronger or faster. But sooner or later, the one who wins is the one who thinks they can. And I, I just want to throw that out. I think that's very, very important. As we, uh, we had a chance to uh, judge different pro projects that uh, kids, students at BYU Hawaii did for an entrepreneur class, their, their business idea, their, their product. And it was just amazing how many kids sat down and you could tell they felt that they belonged just by the way they acted. And how many, most, you could tell did not feel like they belonged by the way they acted. So it's just a simple thing. And uh, we, uh, we found it out with in, in Sony Records. I found it out on the stage in my early days. Well, let's see what, uh, what is another one here. All right. Uh, Package yourself as well as possible. Perception is reality. Um, after I did the high school gig with the thousand people showing up at Highland High School, um, I thought to myself, wow, I've heard, I think I heard somewhere this whole concept of perception is reality. And it's that whole idea that however you present yourself, however you package yourself, people will believe it. <laughs> like if a total amateur pianist packages himself just like the other big hitters on, on the record shelf, people will believe that that amateur pianist is a big hitter. They won't if I make my cover and put a lame self-portrait, uh, self-picture that I took on the cover. And it looks homemade, just because I wanted to save money. Make sure you package yourself in a way that is worthy of a world-class project. And that was some advice that I got, and it was really, really great advice. And um, in, the, in those days, I went in to record my second recording, and this was, I'm so thankful for this. The recording engineer at Bonneville Studio said, well, we just, we just got this new piece of recording equipment, and uh, 
we can, we can do it the old way if you're more comfortable, but if you want to do this other way, we can make a compact disc when we're done instead of a cassette tape. I'm like, wow, that, that's aw that was just like, I, was, I think I was one of the first independent local artists in Utah to be able to um, be able to use that, that piece of equipment. And it was so, such an advantage to be able to have a CD because CDs were, uh, CDs were uh, getting more and more popular. They were overtaking the, uh, the cassette tape. And uh, it was just a new thing in the record stores. And the fact that I was able to go to the record stores around Salt Lake and say, I've, I've got, I'm an independent artist, I've got these 20 CDs, will you please, you know, can we sell them on consignment? And the fact that it was a CD with a nice cover, a professionally done cover, they did it. They totally thought I was legit, other than the fact that I was peddling them myself. <laughs> but they knew that it would sell on their shelves, and, and it did. And people, people believed that, that it was a legit act. And then I thought, you know, I, now I, I can't keep performing at high schools anymore. I've got I've to, you know, I've got to perform in Kingsbury Hall. I've got to see what it, what it takes to rent that place. So about 20 years ago, we rented Kingsbury Hall and did our first show. And uh, it was awesome. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. It was a great experience, and it, it was just, I think if I would have kept doing high schools, I don't think things could have happened. So I think the thing to apply to yourself is to make sure you package yourself and your products in the highest, most professional, best light, and actually package it the way you want it to end up. Think of, how do I want this to be, and then package it accordingly. Don't think of how is it now <laughs> and package it accordingly. Because I, I, that's not fair. It's not fair to your product. You believe in that product. You, 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 you know that it comes from your passion. You know that people are going to love it. So package it that way. Um, and then um, the thing that was cool is then people believe it. Like all of a sudden... Somebody at KUED thought, no, somebody at the Symphony, Symphony Guild was in charge of the summer concert series at, at Deer Valley. And they wanted to do, to do on one of the concerts, they wanted to involve some local talent, some local artists that they f felt were up and coming or whatever. And I can't believe they picked me. But I think it's because of Kingsbury Hall and because of a CD. And it starts becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then the Deer Valley, somebody was at the Deer Valley show that was in charge of something at KUED, Channel 7, in, um, or yeah, the University of Utah channel. And they invited me to do a solo show, televised, on KUED. And, and the way things can, can snowball if you just package yourself the way you want to be perceived is really awesome. I've seen the same thing with the piano guys, um, trying to package ourselves. Um, I remember in the early days, I would say, Paul, <laughs> we're going to run out of locations, man. Let's just anticipate it. I didn't even follow my own advice. I said, let's just, let's just be simple. Let's just do all our videos like that guy, that, that guitar player in the orange shirt. You know, He's always in the orange shirt, and he always plays in the same spot. Uh, what, who's the guy's name? Anybody seen him? Bobby McKee or something? Andy McKee? Andy Mackey? I don't even know how to say his name. Look him up. He's awesome. I, I just love his videos. But he's always in the same shirt, always in the same spot in his studio. And I thought, Paul, that's what we got to do. I mean, let's just, let's not worry about trying to outdo ourselves with location after location. And he's like, no way, man. <laughs> he's like, we are going to make the world's best visual content. 
and he just totally shot me down. Guess who was right? <laughs> and uh, I think it'd be fun to uh, show you a little bit of Paul's vision as far as packaging is concerned. This is a drone camera that, and the location we found off the side of the road in Scotland. This is a mashup of Fight Song and Amazing Grace. Hope you don't mind if I interject a few things every once in a while. Way to get a tiny bit more volume, I don't know. There's me. <laughs> Thanks. They're clapping for you, Paul. They're clapping for you. I love you, man. 
So that's Paul's vision. In fact, in the earlier days, um, I'll tell you how this paid off for the piano guys. Um, we, uh, because of Paul again, but you know, Steve and Paul, they have so many cool ideas. When Steve was young, he used to make videos with his friends. He would like get all of the main neighborhood together and he would produce videos. So he's just like this little director, you know, film director. And so he and Paul just have these coolest ideas and uh, the result of it, um, maybe I'll just show you a little bit of this while, while I tell you about it. We, we were going down to St. George in January to film a version of Coldplay's um, uh, gosh, uh, Par Paradise was the name of the song. And uh, we had planned, since it was January, to uh, film in St. George, and we had found a really nice golf course. And uh, this is just how last minute and by the seat of our pants we are. Um, and about an hour and a half before we get to St. George, wait a sec. Sorry, I've got a most popular. Let's see, there it is. About a half hour out outside of St. George, we get a call from Paul, and uh, he says, no, we're an hour and a half out, and he's like, I've got a friend that has a helicopter, and I've been flying around with him, and we found the coolest thousand-foot cliff that he's willing to lift the piano onto. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, I'm like, no way. We freaked out. We were so excited. I was excited for the helicopter ride, you know, <laughs> even just that. I mean, we literally went to Home Depot and bought cables, you know. We didn't know how to even hook up a helicopter to a piano. And we thought, as it was lifting off the ground, we thought, well, if it falls, at least we'll have a viral video, you know, so <laughs> anyway. So this is just an, this is one of those videos that, a typical because of Paul's me, vision, maybe 15, 18 hours on because of Paul's friend, and there it is, being lifted in the air. People have their cell phones out, they're filming it. We got our good buddy Alex Boyer. Collaborations are really good. And this was a really good one for us. But uh, a producer at, uh, this was before we had been signed with Sony. Uh, we were just independent guys. We, we, had, put, we had put out, I think, uh, eight videos before this. And uh, so we were just having fun and, and we were starting to make money with it. And this producer from Good Morning America, former producer, Shelly Ross, somehow saw this video on YouTube and she just wigged out and she happened to be married to one of the most established music managers in the world former record company president in England. He signed Elton John to one of his record contracts. This guy is so well connected. And he literally hounded us until we met with him in Salt Lake. He flew out to meet us. And it's all because Paul thought it would be a good idea to package ourselves in the best possible way. And you just never know, you just never know where things can lead. Um, how much, let's see what time it is. I, I feel like I'm going a little, oh, baby. He's talking about my wife. <laughs> the joy of music. But I think we're out of time. I, I apologize for going way too long. So anyway, thank you for letting me share all of these ideas. I'm trying to think if there's any song that we can kind of play. 
Oh, here, here is another one that I just want to show you if I can just have it as we're maybe asking questions. Um, see, this was, this is fun. This is a, a group where we got all five of us. One day I was, I was trying to come up with an arrangement of Journey, Don't Stop Believing. There's got to be a way to... Uh, there's got to be a way to make to make it sound a little different. So I thought maybe I'll try to put my finger over the string. And I thought that sounds kind of cool. So I was kind of messing around with it, and everybody was kind of around the piano, and pretty soon somebody started plucking some strings, and somebody started putting some kick drum on the bass, and we just started, had this impromptu jam session. And uh, we just thought, man, this, this is something we, we could, could maybe like make a song out of this. And uh, uh, our film, one of the guys that did some film editing for us was there too, helping us out. So I, I hope it's all right if I just play this for you. And then we'll start doing some questions. How's that? Uh, we can talk over the top of it. Oh, man. But this was probably our first, our first attempt at taking a real hot song on the radio. And, uh, and doing something with it. Up to that point, it had been film scores and original compositions and less hot songs. Not really too hot, but this one was just blowing up the charts. This one just went it kaboom, just into the world. It was just really fun. So, again, something that people have never seen before. And very useful. By this time, Facebook was part of the equation, and people were sharing it that way. Thank you for your attention, young people. Should we do some questions? we go thanks so we've got some questions for you before we do this is just a quick reminder for those of you that are in sure. the class if you would like to wait and pick up an assignment form outside in the lobby you can do that and we've got boxes located out there you can fill out your assignment and turn it in in the lobby or if you would rather you can go home tonight do it on canvas and just make sure that it's turned in by 11:59 p.m tonight all right, so we had lots of good questions. Thank you so much for everyone who submitted them in and tweeted them in. These are just a few that we're gonna ask you, some that we thought would be fun. So the first question comes from Adrian, and he wants to know, where do you think you would be right now if it weren't for YouTube? Hmm. Uh, I would be confined in the jello belt. <laughs> Maybe I would have broken out into a couple of other states. Awesome. Well, we're glad that you broke out. Taylor wants to know, how did you determine that music was something you wanted to pursue as a career as opposed to just a hobby? Um, I think I just, uh, I was just, it, it was a hobby that turned into a career. I was making money, you know, teaching piano lessons and playing weddings and that was my main source of income. That was the steady income. And then I was writing music and performing on the side. And thank goodness the, the hobby grew and grew and grew and overtook the piano lessons and the wedding play. I mean, I love teaching piano, but <laughs> it just wasn't very much money. <laughs> 
Our next question is two questions. Yeah. So Eric wants to know, first, do you have an insurance policy on your hands? And second, do your partners have an insurance policy on you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do, both of those. So. Perfect. <laughs> Austin wants to know, locations play a big part of your music videos. How do you select and acquire lo your locations, and what's the process of that? Um, I, Paul listens to the music, and Paul and Shay, who also does our uh, video, videography and video producing, um, they put their minds together. Shay Scott has got a great mind. We're really, really blessed to have him. Uh, on our team, and uh, they just listen to the music and try to imagine, and like I say, a lot of times Steve has amazing ideas uh, for the visual aspect of things. Um, maybe one time out of a thousand, I will have a kind of good idea that maybe something could be used from as far as video, but I am video challenged, so if I really deserve no credit for what you see on the, the videos. Al has great ideas, video, he's got a great visual mind. And uh, yeah, and then they just go out and look and uh, somehow we find stuff. Do you have a favorite location you filmed at? Um, the Great Wall of China was amazing. And uh, the Guazu Falls in, um, South, uh, in South America, in Brazil, and also Scotland there, I'd say, and the cliff, the thousand foot cliff. Um, the, the moving train was fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> too many favorites. I don't know how you choose. Jeremy wants to know, as you are busy traveling the world, 12 concerts in 14 days in Europe, how do you balance work and family life? You know, for any job that requires travel, that's the dilemma. And some jobs require travel, and that happens to be what field that I'm in. And so you just have to, you, you have to make money. So you just have to uh, constantly be trying to measure the balance of or how much you can travel. We turn away probably at least twice as many gigs as we, as we could be doing. We could, in other words, we could be doing twice as many gigs. But if your family falls apart because you're never there, then you're bummed out. <laughs> and your music falls apart. And you're not fun on stage. And everything falls apart. So we try everything we can to, to keep the family together and to, to be the kind of dads that we want to be and support uh, these amazing girls that we married, and so that's number one. That's number one for us, and uh, when it gets out of balance, we, we, we're concerned, and we try to, try to do something about it. Great, and the last question I wanted to know is where do you see the piano guys in the future? Um, on the moon. On the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That would be, that would be so sweet, man. <laughs> but we would have to use a digital keyboard because zero gravity. <laughs> These hammers kind of need gravity. You know. <laughs> but we would do that. That would <laughs> sweet. It might be cold, but we'd figure out a way. I have to play with gloves. That would be a challenge. <laughs> well, the Jeffrey D. Clark Center for Entrepreneurship and the Huntsman School of Business would like to say thank you so much for coming and being thank a part you. of this event. This That's class awesome. would not be possible without thank phenomenal guests. Thank you. Now, Mike, I think people are going to be mad at you, but Mike said he wanted me to play another tune, and whatever Mike wants, he gets. Because <laughs> I'm Mike's biggest fan. I uh, asked John if he would stay and play some music. He said yes. So <laughs> if you have to, somewhere else you need to go, fine. But if you want to play for as long as you want. Uh, <laughs> Only if you ahead. promise to feel like you can leave. <laughs>
please feel like Let you can get up and just songs. leave. Yes. I, I don't want you to feel trapped. Under those conditions, I will play. Thank you. Well, here's a little tune called Waterfall, and I uh, wrote this when I was 17, and uh, this one was very handy to get the cutest girl in the school to like me, which, which was the greatest two weeks of my life. Well, thank you. Just finally getting a little relaxed here. Uh, I'll play two more for you. How's that? This is a little tune called uh, First Run. It's one of my favorites.
Oh, a train wreck in the middle there, but oh well, that's the way it goes. So this last one's a little tune called uh, Can't Help Falling in Love by Elvis. And uh, I will try to play relaxed. <laughs> it's always hard on a piano you've never played before. feeling about you. Great people.